Welcome to the Outdoor Biz Podcast, your home for inspiring conversations with outdoor insiders. Each week, author, speaker, adventurer, and outdoor industry veteran Rick Sayers talks in depth with iconic brand founders, sales and marketing pros, product designers, and industry rising stars. Listen in when Rick's guests offer actionable advice to land your ideal industry gig and grow your outdoor career. Catch us again when the conversation shifts to the hottest outdoor products, destinations, and the latest industry insights. And now, here's Rick. Welcome to episode 258 of the Outdoor Biz Podcast with Chase Anderson, Program Coordinator at Utah State University Outdoor Product Design and Development, and Keeper of the Outdoor Recreation Archive, brought to you this month by Audible. Chase is helping future outdoor leaders navigate their paths into outdoor careers and building a comprehensive collection of catalogs and other documents from early days of the outdoor industry and more. Welcome to the show, Chase. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, good to catch up with you. Good to have you on. We've been chatting offline and emails and texts and whatnot a little bit about all this cool stuff you're going on. I follow you guys on Facebook. Excited to talk about it. Yeah, uh, happy to share. And, and I always appreciate um, the work that you do. Just listening to your podcast, we've found a few people that we've gotten in touch with oh, cool. um, and gotten involved in the program that way. And so it's definitely in my rotation of, of podcasts. Awesome. Well, sure. thank you. So, thank you. And if you want to, if I can help you reach out to anybody or anything, don't hesitate to ask because. Oh, well, I will uh, for yeah, sure. <laughs> love to help you guys all I can. You guys, are, what you're doing is really important for the bi- industry and the business. And it's fun stuff to to look through and read about. So, oh yeah, I remember when that happened or, oh, well that was before my time. You know? <laughs> yeah. Pretty cool. So what triggered your love for the outdoors and adventure? I'm from Utah, born and raised. It's not hard. Or it's hard to not uh, get into this industry. I feel like when you are looking at, at the Wasatch mountains every day, go right. to school. And I just, I have parents who took us out camping is what we did. I, I had a, I have a mom who would was perfectly fine with taking us out of school to go skiing (laughs) and that family time in the outdoors is always the most important thing so when you got parents like that who are willing to get you out of school to go play that's that's a great that's a good thing yeah was skiing the big thing or did you do a bunch of camping and grew up skiing a lot of a lot of camping hiking Mm -hmm. did all all of southern utah Mm -hmm. if you're in utah you got to spend your spring break or fall break down there it's a beautiful spot and then we had a cabin up in the kind of oakley Camas area up mm. past Park City ever since I can remember. Started off being a trailer and and then ended up having a cabin up there too. Ever since I was a little kid, it's that's that was vacation. Staying in the state and going and, and playing outdoors between skiing, hiking, camping. And then later in life got more into cycling. That's what I do now, which is during the warm months. Yeah. But now it's ski season. Just that's been instilled in me for a long time. Mm-hmm. What was your first outdoor related job? Did you have an outdoor related job, retail or anything? Yeah. So for me, I, I had always seen the outdoor retailer show in Salt Lake while it was here. And that was a big influence on me. I thought, wow, this like people work in that industry. That's, <laughs> that's really cool. You uh, paid to play. How do I do that? It paid, paid to play. And I, I don't know if I ever thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to end up working in that industry. I, I, company called Cotopaxi started up in Salt Lake. Mm-hmm. It was the first couple of years and I was going to school at the time, actually here at Utah State where I, I work currently. And I was just passionate about the company, interested in what they were doing, their do good, give back model, loved the products that they were making too. And I, I just reached out to them and asked them if I could help mm. and volunteer and be their field yeah. marketer up in the Logan area where I was based and going to school and figured if I'm on campus, maybe I can spread the word. Sure. And so it was kind of more of a volunteer opportunity, got paid in product, which is how it seems how things start sometimes. And that was really my introduction was just figuring out how to communicate the brand, get the brand out there more and more as the early days. And I had a lot of opportunity to just get in and learn a lot and uh, get yeah, that first exposure with the brand. Too. They were, yeah, it was the first couple of years. Yeah. And so they were looking to, to, yeah, they were looking to get in on college campuses right. and, and get in that way. And I had a lot of opportunity to just explore. And for example, we, their mascot is a llama and right. I'd had a lot of autonomy. I just said, Hey, I, there's a lot of llama farmers up here in, in the cash Valley. I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can wrangle one of them and let the farmer, the owner, let us bring it up to onto campus one day. Oh, cool. And we did that. I, cool. I found someone who let me borrow their trailer and we went and picked up a <laughs> llama, brought it up on campus, walked it around and 
and uh, use that to drum up drum up interest in the brand. So wow, very um, fun. it was a good opportunity to just get my feet wet and learn a lot about uh, about the business. So. That's pretty creative too. Did the llama spit on anybody? They spit a lot. Uh, sure you know. No, no spit. It was <laughs> it was a pretty tame one. Farley was a good llama. <laughs> That's good. That's cool. So how did your media career get started? We'll get into your podcasting a little later, but uh, you you seem like a media guy. How'd that come about? Yeah, I think the Cotopaxi start was big for me, and that helped me get experience in the industry, mm-hmm. kind of get experience in marketing space a little bit. I learned how to put together events and mm. promote a brand that way, and and then that led me to a job at a large fitness company, so maybe not traditional outdoor, but mm-hmm. Icon Health and Fitness mm-hmm. uh, that owns Nordic Track and Proform and Free Motion, and at the time owned Ultra Footwear. Oh, right. So I ended up getting a role there kind of working across departments on the marketing side of things. So Mm. both digital retail events. So we worked the big trade shows while we still had trade shows, uh, (laughs) orchestrated, planned those and planned our presence there. So just got my feet wet and had the opportunity to to explore a lot of different things while I was there for a couple of years. So that's a good experience. Yeah. Yeah. What inspired you to launch the outdoor archive collection? That's pretty cool. Yeah, that so that I I made another transition after being in the fitness space uh, for a little while. I the university uh, Utah State University started this outdoor product design and development program in 2015, mm-hmm. and a year after it had started, they advertised a role for someone to do industry outreach and marketing yeah. for the program. And I thought, okay, I could work for one brand, or I could go work for a program where I get the chance to talk to, talk to all of them. brands across the industry. And right. So that seemed like the dream. And, and to be able to go back to my alma mater and work with students and be a part of that, be a part of the campus atmosphere was really interesting. So I made that jump. And that's what I do full time is do our industry outreach and marketing for the program. And I've been able to hone those some of those media skills that, yeah. that you touched on launching a podcast and handling our social media and marketing and those efforts. But the archive grew out of the program has a history of gear class and the faculty member that runs that and our special collections team that is on in, at the university that do, does all the archival work. Mm-hmm. We got together and just thought, wouldn't it be cool if we had primary documents and print materials yeah. um, that the students could actually study instead of just talk about the outdoor the history of the industry? Why not go and, and see it? Um, and, and study it in the archive. And so we started reaching out to some of our industry contacts that we had built and just started asking if they had old stuff that they wanted preserved. So oh, wow. we ended up finding one individual, Gordon Wing, through a friend, Al Tabor, one of the Mountain Hardware founders. He ended up coming across about 1,200 catalogs from this individual, Gordon Wing. Gordon gave Al the, the, the catalog said, and said, well, my kids aren't going to want these. I don't know what to do with them. Wow. And Al took them and he thought of us later on thinking, oh, these should be in a museum. These should be appreciated. You yeah, know, yeah. I, I can't hold on to these. We got in touch and he sent those to us. And that's really how the Outdoor Recreation Archive really got kickstarted was with wow. this donation of about 1,200 catalogs. That's amazing. And so since then, you've got all kinds of stuff, right? I've seen some of, you post, some of your posts. It's amazing what you're getting. Yeah, yeah, and, and for those who want to follow along on on Instagram, I've, we started a dedicated Instagram account and on Facebook as well, mm. Outdoor Recreation Archive, and I post a scan a day of catalogs and other materials that that come into the collection. Well, I didn't realize so it was that about, often. Yeah, I I was thinking about that when the collection just kept growing. We we have about <laughs> yeah. three thousand catalogs from four hundred different brands, and I thought. I could post every day for a few years and, and not <laughs> you even post a couple that. times so, a day. <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah. So we have endless content. And, yeah. And so I thought people really appreciate the, the beauty of the catalogs. And, yeah. Some and of the I catalogs. had this hunch. Yeah. I was talking yeah. with somebody else on the show a few episodes ago about some of those catalogs were really fantastic back in the day. They were just works of art. Beautiful. There's one that I just shared just recently that it's a Patagonia catalog from 1991, not their oldest, but Mm -hmm. it is beautiful. It's an image, it's a painting of of El Cap, and it's a painting by a painter, Hiroshi Yoshida. Yeah, he's done a lot Um, of great work. Incredible work. And and that's been an interesting thing for me to see is the evolution of these catalogs. The common thread is always beautiful images of the outdoors, but to see some of these that were hand-painted at one time and it's just the level of artwork, craftsmanship, love and care that went into creating 
what, what some people might consider junk mail is really interesting. But yeah, back in the day, it was probably, oh, here's another catalog. But even then, yeah. those of us that appreciated that artwork and stuff, it was awesome. And now it's even more important and more important that you collect it and save it because it is truly fabulous sure. artwork. Yeah, yeah. We'll link to that Absolutely. those things in the show notes so you guys can go find that. Yeah. And you guys also have a still have the rec program. Talk a little bit about that, the degree program. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So it's outdoor product design and development. It's yeah, it's focused on product creation. So there's a few different pathways. If a student wants to go product design, product development, or product management, there's a pathway for them. And we also encourage students to come in who are interested in technical apparel design, soft goods design, hard hard product. We've got some different opportunities for them. It's almost a choose your own adventure in, in some ways, where if you have an interest in a certain category or certain type of product, we've got the courses and a path for, for students. So, That's great. Yeah, it's it's we like to say it's the first of its kind in, in North America. I think there were there was one program that was maybe ahead of us, but it's a one year technical apparel program in, in Vancouver. But mm-hmm. for a four year undergraduate degree, we were pretty early on. Yeah, and it's interesting now how some of these, I got a, my degree, my master's degree from BYU, their outdoor rec program, which they don't offer anymore. And yeah. I was looking at the undergrad collection of where to go get degrees, and those are all have faded away too. I got an undergrad in uh, at Cal Poly Pomona, and that's gone. So there's, it's interesting how as the industry grows and gets stronger and a more important economic engine, the degree programs aren't keep in pace at least yet i think they'll pick up but and that was a motivation for us is we we had conversations with the industry yeah. um, and we just recognized the need and and i think that's a, a really strong point of the program is that we're super tied with industry that's yeah. always been the goal it's is huge yeah. listening to what the industry needs are and then responding and and trying to build a program that is actually what students need to to be successful in the industry and and what to your point there's been a lot of outdoor rec programs but there hasn't been a clear path for people who want to get into product in the outdoor right. industry. And so that was the solution. It's a hybrid of an industrial design program and an apparel design program. Yeah, it was more outdoor guiding and those kind of programs. Mm-hmm. What I took. Yeah, uh, master's yeah more rec management. Rec management, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You had to force the outdoor component of it almost. I remember at BYU, a buddy and I were both in the outdoor side of it. There's only two of us on the outdoor side of it. And we were really fighting tooth and nail with some of the faculties. Wait a minute, wait, let's do this, let's do yeah. that. And they were responsive, but yeah, it's a little different animal. And if you want to do product, you could go mm-hmm. to a BYU and do industrial design. But Correct. at that time, and, and even yeah. today, it's it's a lot of car design or right, right. consumer electronics or electronics, appliances. Yeah. Or, yeah. So that's where we're trying to be a little different. No, that's great. Yeah, that's cool. So back to your archive, is there anything missing at the, or do you have an item at the top of your get list at the moment? What's, uh, what's Oh, there's, there's a lot of things. I'm sure there. there's a lot of um, things, but is there one, one thing you just say, ah, oh, I want to get that before the end of the year, before... You know... There's a couple that I have pending that I don't know if I can share, mm, but right, right. I think just for confidentiality there until the deal is finalized, I don't want sure. to exist. But, yep, yep. but I, I think for us, I told you a little bit off air, but we love the catalog component and we want to be able to have complete runs of catalogs because mm-hmm. that's a time capsule for you know not only our students, but researchers, brands who don't have their complete collections. Right. We, we want this to be a backup hard drive for the industry to be able to come and study their history. This is accessible for everyone. So we love the catalog component. We want to really flesh that out, but I've been really interested in some of the other materials that, that talk about the minutia of what it was like to be in an outdoor brand um, in the early days. My dream is to find early product sketches from early designers or patents or other corporate documents or journals, correspondence between early employees that kind of stuff is what I'm really excited about because that right. helps paint an even more detailed picture of what what the early days of the company were like. And I know that the materials are out there. So that's why it's a hard question, I feel like, to answer. <laughs> yeah. There's not one specific thing, right. but I have in my mind these materials that we want to bring together. And I know that they're out there because I've got a couple that I'm, I I, I think are going to be coming down the pipe in 2021. 2021 oh, yeah. is, yeah. I think, going to be a big year for us when it comes to uh, expanding the collection. Yeah, I'm sure all that stuff is initial outdoor retailer, booth contracts, all that kind of stuff would be interesting. All, all to, of that. Yeah. 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 And, and the, the challenge, I think the risk is that a lot of people just don't recognize the significance of those documents. Right. It, it's kind of the same with catalogs in, in other industries. You think, mm-hmm. oh, that's just junk mail. But 
that's what archives are for. We're interested in preserving the minutia because there's just so much there's, and some of these letters back and forth between early employees could just yeah. be seen as, well, that was just day to day. And a lot of the early employees and a lot of the founders in particular, it seems like they were doing what they were doing. And they didn't think that it was significant. They were just making yeah. equipment so they could go climb or yeah. they could go play. They weren't thinking, I'm changing the world. <laughs> and now looking back, it's yeah. in a lot of cases, these founders did. So. Well, and back then, who knew it was going to be as big as it is today? Yeah, yeah. totally. And yeah, no one could have predicted it. Yeah, and it's fun to geek out on that stuff. I remember when I was at Dana Design and they had moved everything up to K2, the offices there on Vashon, and we were poking through some old wilderness experience. We were geeking out on patterns and all this stuff that the more normal person would go, what? Who cares about that? But it was just fascinating to look at and some of the product samples and stuff. So that's really fun stuff, yeah. And the other point that I, I wanted to get across is the industry is really big and has a it's really huge. deep history. It's yeah. been around for longer than I think a lot of people recognize. And there's so many brands that have been a part of it. I, I think it's easy to remember the big ones that are that are still here today. But unfortunately, in some cases, history is written by the winners. Yeah. And some of the small brands get lost to history mm-hmm. unless there's efforts like this to, to preserve that history. Th- this one might be fun for your listeners. I was flipping through Summit magazine. We've got a mm-hmm. complete run of Summit. As, as I was scanning each of the covers of Summit, I would flip through the back and look at the ads from 55, 55 to 65. And, and in, the, in those early days, ads from Holy Bar, from Jerry, right. you know, some of the key outdoor brands. Right next to them, there's ads for a company called Bud Davis Packs out of Seattle. <laughs> and I have talked to so many people and can find I can't find any information about that company. Oh, wow. There's no record of it online when I do a quick Google search. People who are pretty tied in with the, the industry and who are around at that time, and even people who are in the Seattle region, yeah, don't even know what that brand was. And so the point being that if those materials aren't preserved or put online in a format where they can be found, a lot of that can just be lost forever. So Mm -hmm. that's what motivates me is if if we don't preserve it, some of this history just might get lost. And then we don't get a complete picture of the the history and evolution of the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And back then at those times, there were a lot of folks like that who were doing garage projects, if you will. That's how most of these brands started, but there were a lot of them. It was a smaller time and you could sew a few packs in your garage and put an ad in the paper or magazine and sell a few. It was, was, I guess it was like the internet today. You put up a website and sell some stuff, but Right. Um, I guess if any of you guys are out there listening and you have some stuff, reach out to Chase and yeah. be careful what you wish for, Chase, though. You might get flooded, but I think that's oh, what you gosh. want. We, that's we what you have want. been, and, and, <laughs> and we'll take it for sure. Yeah. If people want to see, uh, I, I can send you the, the website, and you can actually check before anything is sent to us. We have a full list of oh, cool. in, the, in the collection. There's a whole index that you can gotcha. look at mm-hmm. and see what we're missing. So I, I can send that over yeah, to you. Yeah, we'll link to that in the show notes, too. That'd be great. We're going to take a little break and give some love to our sponsor. Hey, do you love to read but don't always have the time to sit down with a good book? I'm the same, and sometimes I just feel like having someone else tell the story. Well, if you use Audible, then you know. If not, you're missing out. It's like having a library in your phone, and I use it a lot. Audible helps the miles fly by when I'm on the road as I'm enjoying great books I discover or are recommended by friends. Get your free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash theoutdoorbizpodcast. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from. Go to audibletrial.com slash the Outdoor Biz Podcast and start your free 30-day trial with Audible today. And now back to the show. The I, I thought I'd mention a couple of the new collections that we brought together that give maybe listeners a better idea of some of the other things that we're trying to build. We're within the larger outdoor recreation archive, we're trying to build out sub collections for mm. individuals. So they have their own space. Yep. But we so the early days of the Oval Intention from the North Face in 1975, there were a lot of people who were involved in that process. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to a few of them, but I came across one individual who, Bob Gillis, who was a contributor. He he wasn't necessarily an employee at the time, but Mm -hmm. rolled up in a van one day. (laughs) He was just fascinated with geodesics. And he came by with a bunch of little models and said, we we should make one of these. And they came together and with some of the North Face employees and ended up designing the Oval Intention uh, tent. We, we ended up working with his wife. Bob is, is not really in good health right now, but mm. his wife ended up sending us all of his patents for wow. not the oval intention, but mm-hmm. for other tent designs, other mm-hmm. geodesics that he was working on at Holy the time. Cow. 
and we'll be receiving some of his old sketchbooks as well. That's cool. and so now on the website, we and we can send you links to this as well. We have a collection, the Bob Gillis collection. Nice. And so that within that, there's a description of him, his life, his contributions to the industry, and then an index of, okay, the patents, the number of the patent, the description of the patent. And so that, and it's on a research-based website. So if Mm. there's any researchers out there who are studying this history or writing a thesis about this industry, those materials become searchable Mm -hmm. so that people can come in person at some point and and actually see the items um, in the collection in person. So that's the vision is building out individual collections for specific people and brands uh, in the industry. That makes sense because there's so were so many of them. Like you say, some people weren't necessarily working for the brands, but they were involved with ideas and design yeah. and so forth. Yeah, very cool. That's awesome. We'll link to that in the show notes too. Sounds like fun stuff to pour through. Now let's shift gears a little bit. What was the, you're a podcaster. What was the inspiration behind your Highlander podcast? Yeah, so that was, uh, and I should give some background on the Highlander name. Utah State, I believe it was in the 60s or 70s. Well, our mascot is we're the Aggies, the agriculturalists. We're in we're an ag school. Right. A- at some point, the university got this idea to change the name of the mascot to the Highlanders, and it did not stick. It, mm. it, people were pretty frustrated with the name change, and so it was short lived. But I thought, oh, it would be fun to. We have individuals from the outdoor industry who are coming at, at the time coming to campus and speaking to our students, mm-hmm. people from major brands. And sharing really valuable insights with our students. And I thought, it's it's really great. But at the same time, it's a shame that these lessons that this one group of students is hearing, they're the only ones that are going to be, be able to appreciate it and right. hear it. Mm-hmm. And it would be nice if that group could be able to reflect back on it or refer back. And it would be great if the rest of the program and others in the industry could hear these great stories that are coming out of the program. So it, it really started with, with that in mind. We have great guests who are coming to campus. Why not just sure. after their presentation, have them jump into a studio and we'll just do a quick interview. I had no real experience. And so I worked with the student media team on campus that runs the, ra- the campus radio and mm. they got me up to speed and taught me how to uh, record and edit and cool. and do all of that. And and we just started from there. Whenever we'd have a guest speaker on campus, I'd pull them into a studio afterwards and we'd do a quick interview Perfect. about how they got into the industry, a, a little similar to what you do. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, it started to grow and we'd just record the presentations that, that some of the get, these guests were giving in class. Right. And then when the pandemic hit in March, especially, that's when I realized, okay, everything's shifting. We can't do in-person guests anymore. Mm-hmm. And I, I just thought, why are we limiting ourselves to speaking with only those who are speaking to a class? And so I just started reaching out to people that I know Excellent. and having conversations. And rather than keeping it to a class schedule, it's, well, let's just release every week. I'm having mm-hmm. enough conversations. We could do that. And from there, this history project really started to grow as well. And so we started a history of gear series as a part of the larger podcast. So cool, cool. I, I have some similar to you, have some conversations with some of the, the outdoor pioneers mm-hmm. of the industry. and. Mm-hmm. And that started with talking with Bruce Johnson. And if you're not, if your listeners don't know Bruce Johnson, he's been running a website called The History of Gear since the 90s. I was going to say a and long time, yeah. Yeah, he's been documenting the history of the outdoor industry all on his own for a long time. And his website is a wealth of knowledge. And so he and I would just get together weekly and we'd just talk about one company that he oh, cool. wrote about on his website a week wow. um, just to help digit almost turn his website into an audio form. So that's where the history project really, really started to grow and develop. And we have since had great guest speakers like Hap Klopp and Mark Erickson, Jan Fletcher of the North Face. Yeah. Uh, Dana Gleason was on, Sally <laughs> McCoy, Al Tabor. We've had a, a good number of guests that your listeners are probably all, all too familiar with. So yeah, I think a lot of that, folks have been, been on both. Fun. I've listened to a few. They've been on both. The Tom, yeah. Jim Thompson and Greg were out there, yep. I think. Yeah. 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 And then we're, we're trying to find some of those who, who haven't been talked to before as mm-hmm. well. I think the, one of the family members of, let's see, Gene Crenshaw, who started Summit Magazine. Oh, we talked cool. to one of their relatives about the history of, of the magazine yeah. and growing up you know, the, this individual helped print some of the, the magazines. Right. So we're, we're trying yeah. to find some, not only the, the big outdoor pioneers, but yeah. some of those who haven't had the opportunity to share their story as well. So that's, that's awesome. Been a fun, that's fun very project. Cool. Yeah. I've been that was listening. a long answer. That was a long answer about the podcast. Well, yeah. As well as I do. When, once you get into the podcast world, 
you know, there's a couple of ways you can go. You can talk about the activity of podcasting, which there's a lot of things that we can talk about there, or you can talk about your topic, which there's also a lot of things there. And I think the beauty of what you and I are doing in the outdoor biz, there's so many great people to talk to that yeah, it's yeah. just endless. People have heard my story. I just started, I wanted to share the the stories that got told in the aisles of the trade show. So many times right. you'd be outside of a booth sharing a beer and this story would just impromptu come out of somebody's mouth and it would likely never be told again. And so this was the idea to, to catch some of that stuff. But yeah, there's just so much content that we can talk about and people to talk to. It's super fun. I'm glad what you're doing is, is it's great. You, you mentioned there's so many people to talk to. I'm looking at my queue of, of <laughs> podcasts I need to edit and it is growing way too long. Yeah. There's not enough weeks in the year to, to post all of this good content and good conversations that are out there. So yeah. And part of that is self-inflicted because we've experimented <laughs> with some other formats as well. We, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, there, there isn't a good weekly roundup of what's happening in the outdoor industry. There's a lot of that on the newsletter side, mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the web side, but I thought maybe I can just do a every Thursday talk about what some of the things that happened in the previous week and yeah. you know what I think that means. So we've started doing some of that as well. So it, it's it's always evolving, it's always changing. And mm -hmm, at mm -hmm. first it was just talking to people in the outdoor industry. Then it turned in we added the history component and then we're I added a current events um, That's cool. Yeah. piece to it as well. So mm -hmm. it, it it's constantly evolving. As you yeah. Know. Yeah. And I've broadened out I do a little more than just the traditional outdoor. I do adventure travel and I dropped an episode with Bob Carlson from Arbor Collective and the, you know, action sports, skate, surf thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's when you go that route too, it just it expands it. And it's just, I have a lot of fun doing it. What are a couple of things you enjoy most about podcasting? I think it's, sometimes I, I thought about my my job in the industry and, and some of the things that I feel like I'm good at. And I feel like I'm a good connector. I feel mm -hmm. like I'm someone who can recognize a need and and think oh there, i know someone who would be a great fit for that yeah. and and sometimes it's hard to quantify that impact mm -hmm. or what that that skill is and i feel like podcasting has helped solidify that for me mm -hmm. so if anyone was ever to ask what do you do for your job instead of saying <laughs> oh i connect people and it's this ambiguous thing it's it's easier to refer back and say oh here's a hundred episodes of conversations that we had with people in the out, outdoor industry yep, you know yep. So I like that aspect of it. It helps ground what I feel like some of the things that I'm, I'm good at. I'm just a curious person too. So it's nice to be able to, to make this part of my day-to-day -day job where I yeah, can just have fun. conversations with people. So that's fun for me to take something that I just like to do anyways. I, I'm like you. I just like having conversations at OR. And to be able to make this part of my day to day is a dream. It's so. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I just love sharing all the stories because there's so many great ones. So I don't want to be the only guy that heard them or me in that small yeah. group. It's just such, such fun. Yeah. And people totally. have great yeah. histories and great, interesting ideas, how they got into the industry. And it's just super fun. Yeah. And for a while for me, I was just sat on the outside looking in and, right. and I'm a big podcast listener. I've loved listening to podcasts and, and yeah. just find a lot of value out of it. And at one point I just thought, oh, that's that's something I want to do. And, and so to finally jump into it and be a part of it rather than be someone looking from the outside in yeah. that, that, you know, it's an itch I wanted to scratch. So that's been a fun, fun thing to be able to do. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. I'm glad we're doing it. Talk a little bit about the outdoor or sorry, the Utah outdoor association. What does that group do? I'm involved in one of their committees. I'm on the education committee where I'm okay. here at Utah state, but they are, a trade association for Utah. So it's, okay. it's companies coming together to support and grow the outdoor industry in Utah. So yeah. OIA, but on a state state level, the state has a great office of outdoor recreation that, that does great things and is tied to the state. But from my understanding, and we could get you connected with the executive director of that group to, to tell his part of the story. Yeah, it'd be but, good to have him on too. I've talked to some of the but, other, I talked to Luis Benitez when he was at Colorado yeah. and we're still putting one together here in California, but I've talked to a couple of them. Yeah. So this is a separate group from the, the office of outdoor recreation at this, the state level. I know some of the brands wanted to come together to have a company led trade group mm -hmm. um, that could work in concert with this, the state office. Gotcha. So I think they have similar goals in that way. It's, mm -hmm. it's all about supporting the community, supporting outdoor companies, and there's a product focus to it. So mm -hmm. helping the outdoor product companies in the state continue to grow and develop and 
you know, hopefully attract more outdoor companies to the state or hope entrepreneurs who are looking to break in and, and build the next great outdoor company in, right. in Utah as well. So it's a group that's working in concert with, with our great state office of outdoor gotcha. recreation. Yeah. Cool. We'll link to them in the show notes. Yeah. So do you have a favorite outdoor activity you love to participate in on a regular basis? So many things you to know, do there in Utah. <laughs> yeah, reg- during the good weather, I, I love to bike on a regular basis. and I'm a roadie, so mm-hmm. I like hitting the farm roads in Cache Valley. We're, they're pretty quiet. Mm-hmm. And for me, cycling has always been one of those things that I've just, I, I love the freedom that comes with. There's something about just cranking on your bike. And you just cover so much ground. You get to see right. so many beautiful things on a bike. I've tried to get into running and kudos to anyone who can run. <laughs> but I, I always just find myself hurting more than yeah. enjoying myself. But <laughs> I, I can go on a bike and feel exhausted, but also just feel so good at the same time. And and, and, and cover a lot of ground and see a lot of the beauty of Cache Valley while I'm doing it. So uh, I always really love cycling for those That's reasons. That's great. Yeah, you got a lot of great roads to ride out there. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any suggestions or advice for folks wanting to get into the outdoor biz or grow their career if they're already in the biz? Yeah, this is advice that I give to our students all the time. Mm. I've, I've been doing a lot of career counseling in some ways with some of our students, and I, I create some strategic plans with each of them and help them figure out and navigate how, how to break in. So I, mm. I love talking about this. But cool. for me, I just feel like LinkedIn is one of the most underappreciated tools out there, especially now when you can't go to trade shows and things. Yeah, you can't, we don't have that. Yeah. That's a, in my role, I've reached out to people on LinkedIn that I never thought would get back to me, C-level people at major outdoor companies. Mm -hmm. And I've had people respond to me and be really kind. And while they don't necessarily have the time to answer my questions, they'll introduce me to someone at the company and help get me connected. And so I, I just think there's so much opportunity to get to know other people have those conversations and, and it's all on how you do it. I have to remind our students, don't just send messages to people asking if you can get an internship. That's a big turnoff. Yeah. And these people are busy, but if you can go in and ask good questions and be curious and it's all in your approach, but Mm -hmm. I've found a lot of success doing that that way. But I think the other piece is build something, get into the outdoor industry by creating something of your own. That doesn't Mm -hmm. mean starting a company, but everyone can start a podcast or write some content or right. po- post pictures or create a product. There's a lot of things that you can do to, to rather than sit on the sidelines, mm-hmm. jump in mm-hmm. and start contributing. So you can get into the, the outdoor business just by contributing something, right? Yeah, no one, that's, no one has to give you permission. That's good advice too, because you want to lead with value, right? Some mm-hmm. of the other guys I follow outside the outdoor industry, that's one of the things that they talk about all the time is we all get inundated with asks, right? Can you help me this? Yeah. Can you look at this? And I think if you start there, you just, it's going to set you back a bit. But if you lead with value and something that you've created or something that you can offer, then you're going to, they're more likely, everybody's more likely to reach out and help. They're all helpful anyway, but start right. with well, with value. I think I'm glad you mentioned that. You put that in a really good, a good way. Uh, <laughs> I You distilled down my thoughts into something that made a lot of sense. But I've noticed that from a program perspective. Um, mm-hmm. I think sometimes like from a university perspective, it can be perceived as, oh, this university is reaching out because they're looking for a new endowment or they're, or they're looking for a, a big donation or scholarships uh, mm-hmm, right. or they're looking to ask something from mm-hmm, me. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where I really liked the approach that we've taken with no, let's connect you with students for internships and jobs. Let's, yep. you know, hey, we've got this archive that we're building and yeah. we want to give you access to it. That's, it's like you said, it's give rather yeah. than take. Exactly. And but as soon as you give and add value, like things come back. And certainly anyone listening, we would love endowments. We would love scholarships. We'd love all of those things. Mm-hmm. But we've got to be able to, to place students in great jobs that, that add value to companies before mm-hmm those things come back and before companies recognize, oh, this is this program is of value to the industry. We need yeah. to reinvest in it. Yeah. So it's That's the good. same of individuals, right? So I think if you can find ways to give, good things will come back. Yep. That's it. I totally agree. Yep. As we wrap up here, do you have any favorite books or books you give as gifts? You must give books to students or recommend, I'm yeah. sure. Oh, man, I've got your book over here. Oh, your thanks. book's been great. <laughs> I've, I, I don't have any that I you know, have given out recently. Let's see. I actually just read, I'm looking at my books down here next mm-hmm. to me. I've mm-hmm. got a whole pile of books. I need <laughs> to read more of them. I'm the same way. Um, this, <laughs> and I, I read a lot. I just can't get to all of them. 
Yeah. It's like I'm podcasts. There's one, so many things. There, there's so much content, but there's one, it's not necessarily outdoor, but I've to better understand what our students are going through from mm-hmm. a design perspective. I've been reading the design of everyday things by oh, Don Norman. Cool. And it's a fantastic book, super approachable, really talks about the design process, the design of the world around us. It, it really hits home this idea that everything around us is designed, whether right. it's intentional or not. And it's a super approachable book. So if you're not a designer, that's okay. You the, you could get through this book pretty quickly and, and learn some really interesting things, whether you're in design or management or cool. whatever. I've really enjoyed that one. And then I'm I'm interested in diving into, I got this recommendation from Jocelyn Rice, who is a designer at Columbia Sportswear. Mm. And she was speaking to one of our, our classes and she recommended this book that I'm really interested in getting into, but it's called Hunting and Fishing in the New South, Black Labor and White Leisure After the Civil War. Ooh, interesting. Um, so I hadn't heard about that one, but was really interested in getting to that one yeah. as well. So oh, I haven't we'll, read it yet, but. Yeah, we'll link to both of those in the show notes. They'll sound, I'll have to pick both of those up. Sounds like they're right up my alley. How about a favorite outdoor gear purchase under a hundred dollars? Oh my gosh! You know where we've been inside so much more. Yeah. I have been loving the Teva moccasins. Oh, um, I didn't know about those. Just yeah, those are great. They're just they're comfy. I'm indoors more than ever. As much as I'd like to get outdoors, which we can. Yeah, you know, there's lots of safe ways of doing that. But I find myself working from my basement, doing at the university working from home. Mm. And uh, so you just got to have some comfy outdoor products. As That's well. right. So I've, I've really enjoyed those. Those cool. have been great. We'll link to those in the show notes too. That sounds pretty neat. Uh, as we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to say or ask of our listeners? No, just happy to be a part of this industry. I and Anyone who's, again, looking from the outside in, I was doing the same thing only a few years ago. And I attribute a lot of what I'm doing now to offering to help Cotopaxi and get in on a volunteer basis. I wasn't being paid to yeah. to help them do things, but I was interested in the industry and, and I'd never could have predicted that that would have given me some of the experience that I think helped lend some credibility when I was applying for this position. And I could yeah. lean back on it and say, I have worked in the outdoor industry. Like <laughs> I, I understand the business yeah. to a degree. And so I'd say just jump in any way you can. That's yeah. Yeah. And it all starts with leading with value. You, you provided value to Absolutely. Cotopaxi and look what happened. Look how it turned out. Absolutely. Good for you. Yeah, definitely. And if people want to find out or follow up with you, where's the best way? You can message me on all of the outdoor uh, product design development program social media accounts. Okay. Um, we use Instagram a ton, USU Outdoor Product. Okay. But you can find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. And But my email as well is just chase, C-H-A-S-E dot Anderson, A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N at USU dot E-D-U. Excellent. Happy well, to talk. Cool. Well, we'll put all that in the show notes. It's been great catching up. I look to look forward to seeing you in person again one of these days. It'll happen soon. Not, maybe not a trade show, <laughs> but you'll find yourself in Bishop or I'll find myself back in Salt Lake. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Outdoor Biz Podcast. Be sure to visit our website, theoutdoorbizpodcast.com, where you'll find show notes with links to everything we talked about and more. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or spread the word and tell a friend about the show. That would really help us out too. Be sure to tune in every week. And thanks again for listening to the Outdoor Biz Podcast with Rick Sayez.